Beautiful voice. Thank you, Saida. So a word we toss around a lot in our spirituality path, our metaphysical approach to understanding the way in which the universe works is the word dualism. Dualism, meaning separatism. And we teach uh, particularly that our idea of God or our understanding of God is not a dualistic God, much to the opposition of the way in which most of us were raised in other religions, where we looked at God as a separate entity, as a being, perhaps a judgmental being, but um, a separate being nonetheless. And one of the things that is required of us, if if we choose to, to walk this particular philosophical path, is to begin to dissolve and to... Uh, to break up that idea that God isn't separate, that we in and of ourselves have been called, our soul's assignment has been called to walk this earth as a vehicle of that which is God. So then God is where? God is us. God is a part of us. And that all of life is an extension of God. So as we look at life and as we interrelate with life, there has to be an honoring of that. There has to be a sacredness of that. There has to be an awareness that uh, when we say something like, I am my brother or my sister's keeper, what that means is I am the keeper of the truth of who they are. I'm not responsible for their actions, but it's my responsibility to keep in mind, in consciousness, the fact that they are a divine creation, regardless of the way in which they behave. It doesn't mean I have to do lunch with them or date them or marry them or you know, be interwoven into their ideal, but there is a requirement within consciousness that I look at all of life, all sentient beings, and I realize that they are an extension of that which is God. So that really is the ultimate in the dissolution of separatism, in the, in the dissolvement of that which is dualistic thinking. So it's an exercise for us particularly in our world, in our human existence, to walk around going, I'm connected to that. I'm connected to that. I'm connected to them. We are one. We are an extension of each other. And so it's fascinating because when we look at the world, it appears to be operating dualistically. We have a world right in this very second, the second that you're sitting here, there are thousands upon thousands of beautiful, miraculous unfoldments and expressions of love. There is reuniting, there is breakthrough, there is success, there is jubilation, there is birth. There's all kinds of activities that are transpiring across our globe right in this very second that are an expression of the unified nature of what we call the universe, our world. Also, in this very second, There are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of experiences that appear to be opposite or separate from that. There appear to be governors of state and their their staff who block traffic um, and who do things that appear to be so ridiculous and vindictive and petty. There there uh, There is lack, the seeming appearance of lack. There is starvation, there is disease, there is rape, there is murder, there is man's inhumanity to man happening in this very second. But we are told what? That in the observation of that, that the the true reality is, is that there is no separatism. So then what's going on? What's going on? What's happening is, is that all of us as sentient beings, are exercising our free will to choose which side of that fence that we operate on. We either look at the world through the lens of that beautiful synchronistic energy of oneness, or we look at the world through opposition. And we are told whatever lens that we look through then is magnified because that lens then is an expression of the way in which we hold ourselves the way in which we integrate with the world, the way in which our core values and beliefs are expressed or a byproduct of the lens by which we see the world. So then the lens that we see the world subsequently becomes ever unfolding. It becomes the waves that crash up upon the shore of our existence. So if the lens of the world that we look at is a world of less than, 
is a world of ain't it awful, is a world of competition and pettiness and greed. If we continue to look at the world through that lens, then the world doesn't change. It stays in harmony with that. But if we decide that we are choosing to then look at the world through the lens of, of the absence of duality, but the expression and the understanding of oneness, then more of that can be revealed. And there's, it, it doesn't change either way. And so we are told then that we li live in a world that is operated by law, and therefore is the explanation of that law. So Ernest Holmes said that the universe will never deny us anything. Think about that. The universe will never deny us anything. The universe being the operating system, the divine operating system of consciousness that will de not deny you what it is that you see through the lens of your own particular level of awareness. So in your level of awareness right now, if you can only hold so much in terms of your personal good, then the universe will deliver that to you but it will not deliver to you anything more than that because that's the way in which the law works. So then our requirement as we look at this month of going back to basics is understanding once again that all of good and all of what the universe is delivering to us is our responsibility. Don't you just hate that? You know, there is that phrase, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. <laughs> because so many of us in, in, in the dualistic version of life have grown accustomed to what? To blaming other people. Of being able to look and read the news and go, oh my God, these people are awful. And casting judgment and, and sometimes being almost relieved that we have no association with them. You know, I have nothing to do with them. That's not me. But when you look at a world that does not have dualism and that operates from the unitedness of all consciousness of all beings, then it's, 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 it's quite the undertaking to be able to look at the activity of those who are engaging in, act, in things that are less than loving and owning the fact that we too have the genesis of that activity brewing inside of us. How can we say that? Because if it wasn't there, we wouldn't recognize it. It's the, if you spot it, you got it. So when you spot an activity in regards to somebody's behavior that you don't like, it means that the same behavior resides inside of us. And there's huge responsibility for that. And so what that does is it breeds solution rather than breeding judgment. And so as we go back to basics, we talked about last week that the first fundamental truth of those basics is the idea that the thing itself, and we call it the thing because we're talking about that which we, we understand God to be, is beyond gender. It's life. It's beyond articulation. We do not even actually have words in our languaging to be able to wrap around our understanding of what we term God to be. That's how enormous, that's how boundless this understanding, this vibration, this energy, this life essence is. So we, we search for words in our human clumsiness to be able to define that. But we realize that the only thing that's ever going on is that thing itself, the activity of that life itself. How can that thing itself then have anything that is that is rooted in separatism. So our work, the joy of the game of this life is to be able to put ourselves into those situations where it appears as though separatism is alive and well and go, that's not true. It's not true. The only thing that's real is God. And it's so easy to do that for other people, right? Because we're not invested in their drama. We look at their drama and we go, wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> but we're not invested in it. But when we look at our own drama, when you look at your own drama, and you go, that's not real. The only thing that is real is the thing itself. And we can spend every waking moment of our time here on this planet 
trying to grasp and to understand and define what that is. Because the beauty of that is ceaseless. The, the holistic component of that is ceaseless. It's never ending. And so there is the thing itself, and then we look in this basic series of the way that it works and what it does. Well, the way that it works is exactly what I've described in the beginning. It works how you work it. It works according to your relationship with it. That's why it's free will. That's why you and I have chosen to walk this earth in this crazy seeming illusion of separatism only to be reawakened back to the truth. And that's the growth that we experience. That's the reason why we are here is to explore and to expand and to shed that illusion so that we begin to understand more and more and more of the authenticity, authenticity and the truth of who we are. So Ernest Holmes says this, which I think is just so amazing. He says, we are bound because we are first free. Think about that. You and I are bound. What does bound mean? We are wrapped up in our drama. We are bound. Why? Well, because we are first free. Meaning you were, you were set free. You, you were created and let loose in order to go and venture into the land of separatism. You were, you were given the opportunity to make choices. And so many of us, because we live in a world that seems to operate from dualism, jumped at the fence over to dualism. And so we began to bind ourselves. We began to forget who we were. And so we are bound. We are bound because we were given permission to go let ourselves be bound. And so when you understand that we are bound because we were first free, then the power which appears to bind us is the only power in the universe, he says, which can free us. So think about it. The same power that you and I accessed and used in order to shrink our life, in order to reduce the quality of our happiness, of our, our, of our unlimited nature, all of that power that we freely used by the way in which we think, is the same power that frees us. But you and I have to reach a decision that that's what we want. So the other night, I'm, I'm off of sugar again, and you know how, how happy I get when I'm off of sugar. And so we had gone to eat, and you know, there's, there's that moment, there's that moment after you eat where you go, this is dessert time. <laughs> It's just natural, right? So we were thinking of what, because we're trying to do this together, and boy, that just really sets it off. You know, it's like, <laughs> So <laughs> we had finished our meal, and, and we were trying to think of clever ways to bypass the, the, the sugar intake. So we went to Cafe Intermezzo, which is kind of a bad idea, because they, all they serve is dessert. But they also serve tea. Right? And they have these beautiful, wonderful page after page after page selection of teas. And I remember having tea one, there one time that was so delicious. It was, like, it, it was like the heavens opened up and poured roses in a cup. And I was like, what is this? And so I thought, I'm going to go back. Let's go back and we'll have this tea. And that will sort of circumvent the dessert thing if we sit away from the dessert case. <laughs> so we sat away from the dessert case and and I looked through and I think, oh, I thought, that's it. Okay. So I ordered the tea and the tea came and it wasn't that tea. <laughs> it was okay, but it wasn't the heaven open up pouring a rose into my cup kind of tea. But I drank it anyway. And afterwards, it was fascinating because Ty said to me, he goes, if the universe gives us anything that we want, why didn't you get your tea? <laughs> So I thought for a moment, you know, because I have to be wise at all times. <laughs> and then it hit me. I know exactly why I didn't get my tea. Because I stopped at the first serving. If I had really wanted the tea, what would I have done? I would have said, you know what, this isn't the tea. I'm, I'm happy to pay for it but let me try this one. 
And if that one wasn't the one, I would have sent that one back. But what, after he said that to me, I realized that I wasn't invested enough in getting what it is that I truly wanted. Because if I were, I would have sent it back. And I would have continued. So who knows why I didn't. Maybe there was a thought, oh, I don't want to bother her. It's busy. Maybe I'm in, I, I don't like to send things back anyway because I think they're going to spit in it, you know, when they bring them in. You know, I just, I never return food. And so I just, this, this kind of habit, this ingrained thing, and I just, oh, I, I, I accept. I accept whatever it is that's served to me. And so you start to think about that. And you realize that law is operating perfectly. And so how does that then translate if the universe gives us everything that we ask for? Then if what we have right now is actually not what we're we're asking for, then where in it in mind have we settled? And why do we settle in the first place? I think it's because I don't want to bother, or I'm not good enough, or it's not going to work anyway. There are thousands of sabotage thoughts that follow up the request of what it is that we say that we want. And so the way that it works and what it does is, is that it can only work in alignment with our convictions. So this morning, as I looked at this Back to Basic series, I said, then what is that? That is the deep yes. The deep yes to me is is saying yes to a universe that will supply and give you anything that you desire. What does that mean? When you say yes to that truth, then the universe says that deep yes back to you. That's the reciprocal nature of the law, and that's the way in which it unfolds. Ernest writes, it is the nature of the universe to give us what we are able to take. It cannot give us more. It has given all. We have not yet accepted the greater gift. And see, if you use the T analogy, we get so upset because we want to then blame it upon the waitress. We want to blame it upon the world giving to us when it's just giving to us a reflection of what it is that we're willing to accept. Because that was an opportunity for me. And you're saying, but you wanted that tea, David. Yes, but when it brought me something that wasn't, it was an opportunity for me to become deeply convicted to have a deeper yes about what it is that we want. That's why when you say that you want to have intimacy in your life, when you want to have a relationship with someone, the first person that walks across the threshold of that experience might not be that person. But that doesn't mean that your desire and request isn't being fulfilled by the universe. It's that you are getting to refine and understand what that deeper yes means to you. So it's not that once the, you know, the deadhead person walks and you go, ugh, I'm going to take myself off the market. Yeah. <laughs> it's that you realize you are in refinement. And so you just keep allowing whatever to come so that you and I can refine the deeper yes. But if you no longer send out ships, you know that whole phrase of when my ship comes in dates back to the time in which the ships would leave and that was when trade was activated and the trade would be happening in foreign countries and those people or the owners of the ship would wait for the ship to come in because that's when they recouped their investment for buying the ship in the first place to engage in trade. So when their ship came in, it meant that they would recoup their money back and then make some. But if you don't send out ships, how are you ever going to know and have the deeper yes? So it's not that the universe isn't doing its part. It's that you and I stop. We stop at the first little glitch. We stop at the first level of uncomfortability. And so the universe can only work with the amount that you are willing to participate in. And we get stuck sometimes because there is this cycle of uncomfortability that it seems that we we resonate in. So, for example, if, if the deadhead walks across your threshold and you go, that's as good as it gets, and you keep putting yourself out there, but you think all that you're going to encounter is deadheads, then you continue 
to experience that. If you tithe, if you donate, if you give money, but you give it and you go, God, I can't, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because everybody's looking. I'm doing this because I want David to like me. I'm doing this, whatever reason it is, but it's not from an expansive awareness that I'm doing this to exercise my understanding of unlimited good. Then regardless of how many times you give, it will not be satisfactory. It will not please your heart. It will not advance you in the understanding of the, of the, of the, of the wellspring of good, the wave of good that's there. If what you want is creative expression and you're a painter or you're a writer or you're a, a songwriter or you're an author or you do these things that you pour your heart in, it's so vulnerable for you to put that expression out to the world. But the first time that you do, it's rejected or you get a bad review or you have no sales or you don't get anything and you stop there and you allow that to define what your creative self-expression is, then nothing will ever change, and the universe is giving to you exactly what it is that you say that you want, because what you're saying that you want is to not go further than that. What you're saying that you want is to allow yourself to be defined about the external separation that's taking place outside in the world. So the way that it works and what it does is completely in harmony with the way in which you and I think about the world and the way in which it treats us. Let me tell you, the universe treats you exactly the way that you treat yourself. The universe is in alignment with us. How does the universe know what to give to you and to me? It denies us nothing that we say yes to. So there's yes... And then there's the deeper yes. So the surface yes, I believe, is just what we have come to accept. It's the T that's just eh. But the deeper yes, the deeper yes is so rooted in the fact that you know who you are. You know the value of who you are. That you will not settle until that rose-flavored tea is in your and so that's the way the universe works. You are free to do that. You are free to investigate. You are free to fly as, as broad and as high and as fast and as expansive as you choose to. But you have to migrate to the deeper yes. You have to be willing to understand and wake up every single day regardless of how you feel, Regardless of how many times we've messed up, regardless of how many times our vulnerability has, 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 has gotten the better of us, you have to be willing to stand up and go, you are of value because there is nothing dualistic about what God is and what I am. And the moment that you understand that, you can walk into the beautiful the beautiful awareness of chaos theory. Chaos theory teaches us that chaos must happen in order for something new to be birthed. But the thing is, is you and I run from chaos. We, met, we, we medicate. I was going to say we meditate. We medicate. <laughs> we medicate away the chaos when we should be meditating on the chaos. We want to avoid it when actually it's an invitation that says, walk into me, walk into me, walk into the chaos so you will understand what transformation means. How many times over the years have I said this, run, run towards the roar? Remember that talk? Run towards the roar. Run towards the things that scare you because in the seeming chaos of that is where you will find the deeper yes. And so... This isn't motivational speaking. This is universal truth. This is your map. This is your guidepost. This is the curriculum. This is why you showed up. This is why you signed up to live this life. So I was feeling it last night. I was on fire. And I wrote, there is room at the table 
for everyone. There's room at the table for everyone. There is room at the table for those who choose not to support keeping the table steadily and readily supplied. Yes, there is room for you. There is room at the table for those who contribute a little or just enough so that they can remain secure in the hopes that their supply won't be emptied out by others. Yes, there is room for you. There is room at the table for those who actively choose to contribute what they can as often as they can to the ongoing replenishment of the table. Yes, there is room for you. So if there is room at the table for everyone, then what's the point in contributing anything? What's the incentive if you are still welcomed there whether you bring anything or not? I believe it has something to do with the way that you experience the table. The table is our world. So of course you are welcomed into the world. You're already here. You have been birthed. You're already a nuisance to your mother and father. (laughs) You're already here. But if you bring nothing to the world, no passion, no soulful intention, no vibration of aliveness or natural intent for self-actualization, no support of others, no willingness to challenge yourself and to grow, then your entire time at the table of the world is spent in complaint and self-righteous disdain and comparison of those who sit to your left and who sit to your right. You are blind to the banquet that is before you And all you see and ingest are crumbs and scraps that are strewn around from other people's dining. (laughs) So if you spot it, you got it. Right? So I go, ooh, what's this about you, David? It's when we get so seduced and wanting to put the blame on other people or point fingers and say, that's why this is not working, because your consciousness sucks. (laughs) Don't you love that one? I know exactly why this program failed. She has awful consciousness. When you spot it, you got it. When you begin to take personal responsibility for everything, as, as daunting as that feels, as, as diametrically opposed to the way in which the world operates, that seems, that, my friend, is where freedom is. Think about it. When you take responsibility for everything, then what you bring to the table of the world is everything. Because what you're bringing to the table of the world is such a profound yes, such a deep yes, such a deep willingness to be the catalyst for change that you're not looking and taking somebody else's inventory. That you are solely looking at yourself and doing whatever it is to expand the self-actualization of you. That you never stop. And you just keep bringing things to the table and you just keep bringing things to the table, and you just keep bringing things to the table as service. And you look at other people, and you listen, and you hear what it is that they want. And when you hear what it is that they want, you actually go out of your way to make that happen for them. When something that you want, you go and you help make that happen for somebody else. In Buddhist tradition, that's the way in which they do business. They look at what it is that they want to achieve, and then they go and they help someone else achieve that. Imagine sitting at the table of the world with people who operated that way. And so when you and I are compelled and drawn to that, then the way in which we dine at this table is the metaphor for the way in which we live our life. So what you bring to the world, the world delivers back to you. What you bring to the world, 
What you say yes to, the world says yes back. So Ernest Holmes said that the universe will never deny us anything, but we must have complete receptivity of that anything within us before the universe's gifts can be seen and received. So what we know about dualism then is that we either are operating in heaven or we're operating in hell. And we go back and forth. It's like we have a, a, a swift pass. What's that pass that you go through the toll booth? A bree- we have a breeze card between heaven and hell. You know, because sometimes we're in heaven, right? And sometimes we just breeze right, but it's, it's a little hot when we go back to hell. Uh, those are not places. Those are states of consciousness, and we understand that. And so our job is, how bad, how deep do you want heaven? So when something less than heaven is served to you, do you just accept it? Or do you send it back? And you go, nope, that's not in alignment with what it is that I desire. So know with me this morning. The universe gives us anything that we ask. So we must examine what it is that we're asking. We must look at the belief behind that, the feeling behind that, asking. Because that's what it's responding to. And so we take this opportunity this morning to really get clear on the way in which life works and what life does. And perhaps it seems daunting to be able to go from holding others responsible to completely taking personal responsibility. But perhaps all that's necessary in the migration of that expanded awareness is to simply be willing to do so. And if that willingness is there, then the universe has something to work with. And so let's today start with that seed of willingness. I am willing, I am willing to take responsibility for everything that is unfolding before me. If I'm willing, then the ego can begin to dissolve the self-righteousness, the indignation, can begin to lessen the wounds, can begin to actually heal for the first time. And those limiting beliefs can finally be unattached from us so that we can walk to this table of the world of life and that we can experience the banquet that is already in existence. And so today we just celebrate our willingness. Our willingness to look through the lens and to see a world that works. To state that, to affirm that, to journal that, to to pray on that, to do whatever it takes moment by moment, realizing that it's the moment that is our, our opportunity to exercise this. It is the conversation that we're having that gives us the ability to exercise this. It is the situation that feels uncomfortable that gives us the ability to exercise this. And so we celebrate all. We welcome all. And in the knowingness that the world is working, in the knowingness that God is all that there is. We allow ourselves to just take a deep breath of relief 
and get that we've not done anything wrong. We've all been operating at the best that we know how to do with the awareness that we've had at the time. And today, perhaps if we've listened, our awareness is a little bit deeper, a little bit broader, a little more open. So with this, we take a deep breath. And we move forward, knowing that all is God. And together, in this knowing, we say, and so it is.